Hi, it's Mrs. T, and this is our next lesson in cultural geography class. We're still in chapter one, really early on in chapter one, actually. In the previous video lesson, you got the overarching definition of cultural geography and some of the ways that geography is holistic and all the different fields that it applies to. And now I want to talk about or introduce you to a concept that's going to really be one of the underlying themes of all of the work that we do in class this semester. You can see it on the board behind me. Globalization and globalism are the two concepts. I think it's on the very first page of chapter one where the word globalization is introduced to you. Um, globalization is a gradual process or progress toward interconnectedness of all types of interconnectedness from one country to the other around the globe. So when you look in chapter one, which you do need to get the textbook as soon as possible, when you look in chapter one, it'll talk about, regarding the definition of globalism, it'll talk about gradual processes in ease of communication patterns and trade, imports, exports of goods and even services, people moving from one place to the next to work in foreign countries. Um, currencies being connected, like the, you might have heard that the dollar is the standard currency that's used around the world currently. Some project that maybe in the future it won't be. Um, or, you know, exchange rates and things like this. Uh, also, one of the major themes of this cultural geography class that we're going to look at regarding globalism is food supply. So food is absolutely necessary for people to survive and therefore in order to have a culture, in order to have human geography to begin with, we have to have enough food to support populations. And there is plenty of food being produced in the world right now and certainly in the years prior to the pandemic when this book was published, um, to the coronavirus pandemic that is, um, there is plenty of food being produced right now to feed everyone in the whole world, yet there are some people who are starving and some people who have so much that we are fat, like your teacher, or um, overweight, like your teacher, and, um, and also throw stuff away. You know, we forget that something's in the fridge or we don't take our leftovers at a restaurant or something and we throw them out uh, when there are some people in this world that are starving. And so where is that interconnectedness? Can the progress toward further interconnectedness between places and people around the world. Can that progress um, eliminate some of that? Like, why is there so much some places and so little other places? And people suffer in one place and don't in others when the global food supply for a long time has been well, um, well above what is necessary to keep everybody fed sufficiently. Everybody, all the uh, people on earth fed sufficiently. It just isn't distributed. And that's another interconnectedness, like the transportation systems and the communication systems and agriculture. So um, industrialized agriculture is going to be a major topic that we look at. You might have heard some of it in the news right now. I watch a lot of news in my house because my father-in-law lives with us and he always wants a news channel on. So I hear reports about um, cargo ships filled with wheat leaving a port in Ukraine and arriving in the Middle East, for instance, so that this wheat can be distributed to um, different places that are counting on it. So that's part of the connectedness with globalization. You might be able to grow wheat where you are. The land in your region might be perfectly wonderful for growing wheat or some other staple crop. A staple crop is something that we rely on as a major ingredient or a major part of our calorie intake in a particular place. And so flour is a major um, uh, ingredient in a whole lot of things, um, wheat flour that is. Uh, and so a lot of the foods that we consume, I just grabbed a stack of pretzels and, and um, ate them between videos that I'm making. And so all of that is from a wheat supply from some place. Probably places like the Ukraine that export wheat, that, you know, they make excess, their population doesn't need it, doesn't need all of what they of what they produce, so they export it to other places, and we buy that, and we ship from Stuttgart, Arkansas, right down the street from my house. We ship rice from there to the Philippines, to Japan, to all over the world, um, and they, you know, they count on that, and so that's some of the interconnectedness that there is planning and forecasting of um, 
crops or staple foods that are used uh, by large portions of the Earth's population. And globalization allows for, and I'm going to say it allows, that sounds like a very nice thing, it allows for planning to produce large amounts of these things in the places that are the most um, prepared to produce those large amounts, but it also relies on shipment and transportation. So I mentioned the Ukraine earlier, um, producing a lot of the world's wheat supply. Well, when you're involved in a global conflict over geopolitical borders, I've got it written here as part of the explanation of globalism, we'll get to that in a second. When um, you're involved in a geopolitical dispute, like the, the Ukraine is right now, um, maybe you're not able to produce the wheat that you are accustomed to, and so you're not able to fulfill orders. Well, if you're not able to fulfill orders, maybe you can't, uh, maybe the people who were expecting that wheat are going to have some hard times ahead. And there are some forecasters, uh, when looking at the food supply, that say a food shortage is on uh, the horizon because of globalization. So um, earlier when I focused on you, my choice of the word allow, there are some people that say global Globalization is the only way to go, and it is um, the way of the future. And other people say globalization needs to halt and go in reverse, full blast, because if we aren't able to, um, we human beings are not able to sustain our populations locally in the local environment, we might end up with a time where there is a food shortage. You hear some of that forecasting uh, in financial spheres or prepping corners or any of these kinds of um, discussions about what the dynamics of global politics and production and exchange and economics, all the dynamics that are happening right now in the world. Okay, so um, globalism is another word that I have on the board here. Globalism is simply that the concept or the condition of, you could also use the word condition of, that interconnectedness and how that cooperation from one country to the next is vital for the future of the entire planet. Um, and Or maybe even some globalists and some concepts of globalism maybe even suggest that a world without geopolitical borders um, is what we need in the future. So there are definitely some politicians here in the United States who say that they would prefer not to have border checkpoints or not even to measure who migrates or crosses the border from one side to the next um, on a regular basis. It happened in Europe. Europe for a very long time. There's um, not checkpoints among nation national borders anymore when the European Union was established in uh, the late 1990s. Uh, when I visited there as a, a teacher exchange program in the 1990s, every time I trans I, I went from France to Spain or, or Italy or Switzerland or any of these places, the train would stop and you'd have to show your passport, get a stamp, and then the, then it would you know move on. Now Switzerland knows you're within those borders. That doesn't happen anymore in the European Union. It hasn't for about 20 years. And so some people um, say that there is progress toward that kind of thing in the United States also. And it's inevitable, that interconnectedness and maybe even a world without firm geopolitical borders is the future. Well, this is a very divisive political topic too. Um, and all of this comes from geography, right? A geopolitical border is a line on a map that political officials throughout history, throughout time, or even currently negotiate where that border is going to be. Some borders, such as the border between the United States and Mexico, is established by natural topographical features. The Rio Grande River is a dominant geographical uh, feature that makes that shape of Texas that maybe you can see in your mind's eye um, from a map of the United States. However, if you go up to Canada, there's a straight, pretty much a straight line across um, the top of the United States with Canada, and there is no rhyme or reason other than political agreements and treaties over the years. Uh, there's no rhyme or reason why that line is where it is. So a geopolitical border is a line on a map that might be because a mountain range divides this and that, or it might be because a treaty where politicians signed on the dotted line and shook hands decided that that's where the border is going to be.
And these things change over time. Um, they morph all the time, and some people fight over them, back to the Ukraine and uh, Russia conflict. Because essentially, if I understand it, which I only have a rudimentary understanding of it, Russia wants um, part of Ukrainian territory, and the Ukrainians say no. Or the Ukrainians say no. So anyway, there's a lot of... Um, talk about globalism, globalization uh, in the world today, monetary systems, food systems, like I mentioned, you could, um, if you want to, you could look at um, the World Economic Forum's website and their plans for, um, I can't remember what the name of it is. Well, there's one plan that's called the Great Reset, but the other one is like um, Plan 2030 or something. It's like a, it's like a projection for um, the next decade, you know, between now and 2030, the year 2030, to have um, green systems in place instead of fossil fuels and different kinds of things like that. And it relies on global cooperation among nations and interconnectedness of governments to sign treaties to agree to work in tandem with each other to achieve these certain goals. The next video that I'm going to show you, and the last one for this um, for this week one, I didn't make, but um, a YouTuber who has a channel called City Prepping made this video very recently, and as I was watching it, I thought this has a ton of this globalism, globalization, um, geopolitical stuff, agriculture, monetary exchange, all of this kind of concepts that we're going to be touching on throughout the semester. It has a whole bunch of stuff in this video. It's just under, like I think it's like 12 minutes long and so that's the last video that you'll watch um, this semester or no no this week this is the last video you're gonna watch this week but when you watch it don't watch it for the you must prep for disaster in the future kind of theme which is a little bit about what his uh, YouTube channel is about instead listen to it critically for a particular purpose and look for these exchange systems these interconnectedness between um, countries of the world agricultural systems economic systems education systems monetary systems all of these kinds of things um, and and just analyze it for these features there will be some quiz questions from that video in our quiz quiz two in the week one folder. Please text me if you have any comments or questions. And if you would like to write a reaction paper this week, you got a little bit of stuff to chew on. So between these two videos that you're watching from Mrs. T and this third one uh, from Chris at City Prepping, um, please find something that you would like to discuss these topics, write about them extensively. Don't just go off on a tangent. Make sure that I know you're talking about globalism or some kind of field of human geography or, you know, interest or how your profession, your um, chosen um, field of study relates to geography, why it's on your degree plan, these kinds of things. Make sure that I see that connection between what we've talked about this week and what you're writing about for your paper. If you want to skip it, don't worry. Go ahead and skip it. Uh, watch video two in the uh, syllabus folder in order to understand why it's okay to skip this one. Uh, but if not, dive right in. I think you might have enough to chew on so far. And um, I'll see you in our next lesson. Bye.